Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Moon. I am your host, as always, for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by my esteemed co host, Ricardo Martinez. And today we are also joined by and are interviewing the fantastic John Carvalho. Um, and we'll be discussing uh, NFTs, um, Block One's uh, bullish global exchange, uh, and much more. So stick around to hear the news. Um, Ricardo, first off, I'll just uh, ask you, how are uh, how you doing? How's your week been? I'm doing great, Lawrence. Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to the podcast. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I guess, John, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick intro to our audience. I'm sure most people probably have heard of you anyway, but you never know. Um, so yeah, John is a well-known uh, Bitcoiner, online personality, uh, hard worker, and used to be well as a bit refill. Uh, and he's now working on his own project uh, and podcast uh, called The Biz. So he's a pretty a pretty busy guy. Uh, but yeah, uh, as you already said, John, you're, you're doing pretty well. But is there anything you wanted to add to the introduction about yourself there? Or are you, are you happy with my, uh, my hatchet job? That, that was a pretty good quick job. You know, I've, I've got a new company, not much details yet. Um, I've been in Bitcoin for a while. I've been, I was working at BitRefill as well. Um, yeah, uh, if you don't know me, I'll, I'll make a lot more noise later this year. Uh, okay, well, cool. Well, yeah, I say we'll we'll just crack on. We're not about wasting time on on this pod. So, um, yeah, let's head into uh, into the news essentially. Um, so, Ricardo, please uh, kick us off with your uh, with your piece of news today. My article today comes from CoinDesk, and it's called "The Centraland Founder Unveils Project of Bringing NFTs to Big Time Video Games," and it's about a startup called Big Time Studios which is trying to bring NFTs to mainstream video games, not niche video games, big time titles like Grand Theft Auto and and, uh, games like that. So they think that video games are like walled gardens, which are kind of siloed off from each other, similar to the different shitcoin blockchain without like some sort of bridge. And they think that um, in-game skins and items that you can unlock uh, right now, you can't like transfer them you know, across games or from platform to platform. So they're trying to use NFTs to bring ownership to video game players for their skin so that they can sell them and own them and and that kind of thing. Um, I think NFTs are kind of stupid. So I think this is just another attempt to try to find a use case for something that's completely useless. Um, I think the way forward for video games is going to be lightning and micropayments and sats personally. But uh, what do you guys think about NFTs for video games? So as far as like NFTs, there are always like several use cases people try to present, you know, like our NFTs and uh, one that kind of always seems like the safe one that people like to bring up and always gets people interested also is game NFTs. It's like, you know, the idea of if I get this Excalibur sword in one game that maybe it represents an Excalibur gun in a different game. And yeah, I still have the same item, but it's represented differently in different games. It's an interesting idea. Um, I thought about this more recently, though, and I, I think that like this is probably just first wave stuff, like like kind of like you said, like, where it's like capitalizing on the hype, capitalizing on the interest and, and you know attention that's there and liquidity that's there. But um, long term, if I try to play it out in my head, I think that maybe where this ends up is like open source applications and open source games and this is tricky because these aren't it's like open source software like you don't it's not easy to make money getting paid to do it and so like i think that like when you actually think about a metaverse or an open format network of any kind like the co- the competitive game theory aspects of it you know it doesn't play out all that well for middlemen and so if you start making things interoperable you start you start wondering where does the quality come from like why would Uh, the game Final Fantasy work really hard to make special NFTs that have, you know, cool appeal to them for, you know, a cloud's new sword and and then somehow also support interoperability with some other game. Um, It ends up, you know, not really always mapping. Like you kind of need, it only really works like across square properties. And so what you learn when you start dealing with NFTs is that most of what NFTs are about is not the actual like bear instrument this this unique token what they're about is the paradigm that you can form with others to mutually define those nfts like to basically like assert them as almost like more like credentials 
Um, and so I kind of wonder if the format will flip over time to being more about being like credential based and, and, you know, attestations and, and these kinds of things, the normal way we kind of do provenance and, and stuff with like expensive art or, or, you know, similar use cases like they're trying to make. Um, I know I'm ranting a little bit, but like, it is something that I thought about because I like to try it on. I like to be a devil's advocate and say, okay, yeah, I do think NFTs are mostly stupid. I do think the metaverse thing is interesting, but like, what if you just keep extending this into absurdity? Does it actually work? And I'm not sure it does, um, but the hype is interesting. I like seeing it spark people's creativity, but um, I think this is not the final form and that the current use cases are, like you said, kind of mostly nonsensical. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to, when it comes to NFTs in general, I, I, I I was very positive at the beginning when I first heard the idea. I thought, hey, idea is awesome. Like the ability for people to kind of claim ownership of uh, things and to make money off of things that they previously found it hard to do so, like with art or music. Um, great idea. Um, the problem is that in practice, it just doesn't seem to really work quite well for me. I mean, one of the experiences what, I had what, is- What are they selling and what are you getting? You know, that, that's the question. You know? Yeah, this is the issue, right? So what, what a guy that I'd run into in Clubhouse, really nice guy actually, and he- uh, he'd uh, bought a um, NFT of, I think it's uh, like one of the XRP Riddlers or something had done on some different blockchain. It wasn't Ethereum. I don't know what it was on, but it was on one of these different channels you could buy them on. Uh, not rareable, but we'll say rareable for argument's sake. Um, and so it'd been done. He purchased this and it was a one of one. And then immediately after the platform, for some reason, um, had deleted this guy's account that he purchased it from, this Riddler's account, and it's had, had basically deleted everything. So he had this token that he'd purchased and he was like really happy about it and proud because he was like, oh, it makes it even more rare because everything else has been deleted. But his had also been deleted off of that platform. So because the platform wouldn't recognize it, the, yeah. <laughs> what's the value? There isn't. kind of what I was hinting at. Like there's this, there's this weird side to it where it's true that like artwork is any unique expression. And so even the fact that like, it's issued on a specific platform by a sp on a specific blockchain. All of these aspects are part of the quote unquote art and what make it unique. So you can make that kind of argument and say, you know, no matter what, no matter what, if the company dies or if the website goes offline, that website, I mean, that, that NFT is still like the unique thing that it, that it was originally was when it was made. Um, it's just a matter of whether you have witnesses. And so the flip side of this again is, I'm starting to think that what NFT actually is, the important part is just only the metadata and the kind of the paradigm that people have been able to form together to kind of maintain that metadata together. And so you, I, I think that we'll see better formats for maintaining metadata and, and associating it with, you know, either nfts or other types of things yeah i should hope so um i guess when it comes to this news story specifically uh, i mean my problem is i'm not really a collector kind of guy i never really have been like I, I collect a few little things but not you know nothing like like this i've never really been that bothered by buying nfts anyway um and then the other problem for me is that i always thought that like loot boxes and skins and stuff on games were stupid as hell anyway <laughs> personally so and this just doesn't really appeal to me at all. Like, I'm not really a collector. I don't really like skins and loot boxes in the first place. I don't like microtransactions on games. It really pisses me off, quite frankly. So the whole story, whilst I guess maybe it's cool that like things are developing and getting more mainstream, other than that, I don't really have anything positive to say, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> this has been a little bit of a topic internally uh, for different reasons, but I think that you have to, I think maybe you underappreciate the phenomenon of gamification, of competition, and this kind of, basically the reason why we even talk about game theory, et cetera, like people in every single mutual situation, they need some way to order things. And that is essentially results in like the competition of evolution and all these, you know, the law of thermodynamics and, and persistence of life, et cetera, in, in the abstract. But in the end, like if you strap on some kind of game to some kind of situation, it will like, essentially accelerate that situation somehow on some level. And so you have to basically, we all have to, I think Bitcoiners in general need to get better at appreciating gamification of things and how it can at least draw attention and, and, and make people feel like they have ownership because they have a way of interfacing with the situation that they can measure. 
And I know I'm speaking a lot in the abstract, but like, I think that these kinds of concepts apply. A friend of mine is, is pretty positive on NFTs and uh, I'm pretty negative on them. So when we were talking about NFTs the other day, he was uh, saying that my negativity sounds like uh, me saying that there's no use case and that I don't understand what the value proposition is for NFTs. Uh, he was saying that I sound like the banker sounded in regards to Bitcoin a few years back when, when they were trying to say that it was just for terrorists or that it, it had no intrinsic value. And um, his positivity is based on the fact that he thinks that as like augmented reality technologies get rolled out and as VR becomes more prepping online games and stuff, that these NFTs are going to have value and they are going to have like some sort of use case because as people spend more time in these like virtual ecosystems, they're going to hang like an NFT on the wall or uh, things of that nature. Um, I don't really believe that's going to happen. Like I think the way that games and stuff are going to be using uh, crypto, is going to be more along the lines of like, um, have you heard of the Counter-Strike Go tournaments where you can win Bitcoin and it's paid yeah. over lightning? Like, I think it's going to be more like that. Like money's changing hands because you're competing with someone and you're a better video gamer than the next guy. Um, I don't really see it as like, we're going to be trying to collect these, you know, like Counter-Strike weapons or yeah. skins or, or things like that. I think of it as like, nobody wants your used NFT. Like nobody <laughs> wants your, your, your pre already purchased NFT art. What people want is the hype and the and the kind of hope that they'll be able to sell it to somebody else for more money. And the reason why NFT art seems so exciting is because it's just like people think that there's been value created where there isn't any. It's like, oh, I can sell things that used to be free. Like, cool, sign me up. You know, like I'll start selling JPEGs. I'll start selling all my creations in Corel Draw and whatever. Like they just think that they see an opportunity to monetize something that they couldn't monetize before. But they're confusing that the opportunity wasn't created by the technology. The opportunity was created by the company that had the correct narrative to position itself for the hype of this technology. Basically, like a company like Rarible or OpenSea or whatever. These guys positioned themselves in the right place at the right time to create a marketplace. And that marketplace is what was valuable to all of the users, not the actual NFTs. It was just the kind of gravity of the, the format. That's a really good point. And I guess to me, that's where, if we're talking about VR, because I'm a VR guy, like I, I have a headset. Um, if we're talking about VR, um, I can see maybe, I mean, again, not really my kind of thing, but I can see how other people and maybe even me someday would like to hang a picture on the wall of my VR uh, entrance point or whatever, like home that I generate into when I turn my headset on. Maybe that's a thing. Um, but the thing there is like, the whole point is that like, they feel like at least NFTs almost feel so so centralized anyway why not why don't I just buy like a one-off of a company that just tells me yeah this is the only one we're not giving it to anyone else it feels like the same thing really quite frankly to me that's right what I'm now. getting at with the credentials commentary where it's about the context it's like I think that what we'll learn over time is the mistake people are making is they're placing the value in the bearer instrument but the actual value is in the context basically like the account you have with OpenSea the mm -hmm. The, 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 the schema they use to define the metadata of their issuances, you know, these, these context items and their persistence is what's valuable, not the actual, you know, proof that you paid money for a, a digital picture. Yeah, no, exactly. And that, that's the thing. I think you're right there. Um, did you guys see that? Um, I think I saw this today that eBay, um, as of yesterday, I think, um, have started selling or allowing people to sell NFTs on eBay, which was quite like a really, I didn't see uh, yeah. That. Um, and I don't know because if you type in NFTs, like you can see, this is where I don't, I, at the well, moment, I don't know if they sale. let them because you can sell anything on, on eBay until they stop you if they don't like it. And so, <laughs> yeah. um, what no, they, 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 they realize is they, they probably game the way eBay already works and they're just selling like, it's like when they sell gift cards on eBay, sometimes people would just sell the codes and it wasn't actually a real retailer, you know? Yeah, the actual one. No, yeah, so I, this is what I thought. And then, but then I saw, because they have, there's a statement from the vice president or whatever, and it's saying like, we are accepting oh, yeah. NFTs now and like, we want to build a platform out for it. So essentially they've said they're like not deleting things that have NFT in them anymore because they're yeah. accepting that. But then I just can't quite, unless they're going to like have a section of their site, because otherwise I'm not quite seeing... I'm just not quite seeing how it's going to work. Surely someone's going to sell it on eBay and then just direct you to like another place anyway. Yeah, again, this is I'm a little bit confused by this, but I don't quite see how eBay are planning to do this. But um, well, I, I eBay owns PayPal, sold. don't they? 
and PayPal just did. No, they they got they unloaded payments. PayPal. I'm pretty sure they either unloaded uh, or they separated the businesses like sometime in the past five ten years. Yeah, I think there's some affiliation still, but I don't know how strong it is. Yeah, uh, like originally they were tightly integrated, and then they separated for some reason. Yeah, so it could have been anything to do like brand dilution or whatever. But um, but yeah, I guess um, I, I guess what I'm getting at is like I just it seems a bit like slapdash that they're just like yeah we're accepting them because like you know we just want people to come onto eBay to buy stuff. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't think they've really thought about it, so it feels like people are going to sort of scam other people uh, essentially, really, and just call something an NFT on it. That's what it I think like we'll see a lot of that kind of behavior with like legacy businesses, for lack of a better term. Like I think we're kind of seeing it with like network television how like they're all becoming like liars and scammers and fake news and politics like i think it's because nobody wants to watch tv anymore and nobody is like like they have to be like super sensational and the only thing that people would care about the only reason people will turn on a tv is if it's some kind of like drama about the government or something you know what i mean or about covid and so i think we'll start to see like companies like ebay and facebook as they start dying to like more open formats and you know bitcoin and decentralized web etc they'll start doing behaviors like that probably true that's a good point about tv i mean when i think about it i haven't had a tv plugged into the antenna so like getting any actual terrestrial tv other than like netflix and stuff uh since probably like 2012 so, so that's been quite a long, quite a while because here you have to pay for a tv license Right, if you yeah. want to view the TV, and most so. people have like moved to Netflix and like they're just paying for a TV because they're used to it, you know. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I'll, um, I guess, yeah, I suppose now we've kind of gone a bit off track. I'll, I'll move on <laughs> anyway to the to the next item uh, of news that I wanted to, to bring up. But uh, yeah, this one here, um, so it's been on every <laughs> basically every single cryptocurrency news, uh page but i've gone for one on forecast news actually because it seemed to have a bit more information than than others um and was put in quite a simple block format but yeah so essentially block one uh raises 10 billion us dollars to launch bullish global uh the new cryptocurrency exchange um now it doesn't say this actually oh no it does say this here we go yeah so it looks like um they're going to be so bullish will offer automated market making lending and portfolio management tools using EO, EOS, EOS IO and the EO, EOS public blockchain to produce a cryptographically validated, provable and immutable audit trail. So they paid essentially like 10 billion. I think a lot of it basically came in, in Bitcoin, actually. Um, and it looks like uh, investors, you've got Peter Thiel, um, you've got Alan Howard, Luke Bacon, Galaxy Digitals. There's quite a few like big uh, investors in here. Um but yeah, it seems like uh, EOS is making a step up, I guess, uh, here by actually having some kind of use case for the first time I've come across. But um, I, I don't know. It just the whole thing seems a bit, uh, a bit odd, really. I mean, I, 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 when I saw this, I mean, I had been told about four months ago by someone that that EOS were working on something like this, um, and I didn't know there was like ten billion US dollars involved. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know. What, what are you guys' thoughts? Because like when I first heard that it was like $10 billion, I thought, who needs to raise $10 billion? That's my first thought. And I get there's liquidity, right? And there's, I get that. But like I thought $10 billion? Like it seems seems intense. I, I don't know. I, I just wonder if there's any kind of ulterior motive there. I don't know. It, it kind of screamed odd to me. But I don't know what you guys think on this or if you've had any thoughts on it at all yet. I don't have much optimism for this project. After uh, the EOS social and how miserably it failed, um, I don't really see a lot of future for an EOS exchange. I'll elaborate more. I, I, I really think the whole thing is bullshit. Um, I, I'm not like savvy to how they, these things work, but my guess is there's some sort of like shifting of value from one company to another to float the liquidity into this company. Some not I, I don't want to accuse them of money laundering or anything illegal so much as there are a lot of tricks you can play with that kind of money and and being able to structure companies. And and like you said, they don't th there's no need for the first thing for an exchange or a new Bitcoin service to say to be that we have 10 billion dollars. It's just it's just unnecessary. And so it, it is really all about making them look big, even though they don't even exist and may never exist. Um, and that's the thing, like you mentioned with voice, uh, that platform, I don't even think actually existed till like the last few months that they did like a test release and they just pretended it existed because the way it looked, it looked like a static website when you tried to like look at it, like the beta and such. And it, considering all the money that company has, that was not impressive. It was not impressive as a technological design and it wasn't impressive as graphic design or user experience design. It just was not impressive. 
it just seemed like a project, you know, make a social media website and that's it. With bullish, like I, I really couldn't care less. Like I can't imagine why I would care about some new exchange from Novogratz and blah, 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 blah. Like, and I'll never have any true understanding of what the real liquidity is and how many users it really has because this is the nature of all like modern Silicon Valley sort of shitcoin, major shitcoin companies is they pump all the stats. So you never know it's real. And, and so I just, I, I just don't really care. I don't see any reason why any of us should care other than that like, Cool, billion. You know, EOS still has billions. Block One still has billions. Back from all the way to the last bull market, and they have even more now, and they're throwing it around. Great, um, but I don't trust Novogratz. I don't trust that party of people. Um, Teal being involved is interesting, but you know, the jury is kind of still out with him a little bit as far as whether he's good or going to be good or bad for Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I, I didn't read the full press release or anything like that, but it just looks like to me like they're just trying to make hype because they're starting an exchange. So this is like the first thing when I saw the story, I think someone shared it with me, was like, I, and then this is not me really saying this is the case, but like my first thing was like, well, is there some sort of exit scam going on here or something? Like people trying to get their funds like out of something into something else. And that's, that was my first thought. Because as you said, $10 billion just seems completely unnecessary. Um, I just, yeah, I was a little bit, little bit puzzled. On it that could one. just be a tax thing. It could be like, well, if we sell this 10 billion in ether, then we'll crash the market and we'll, you know, like we'll, we'll incur all this tax gain. Well, what if we just, you know, loan it to a new company? Yeah. I say, I, I, well, we'll be surprised. We'll see. We'll see if, uh, if bullish global, uh, becomes real or not. Speaking of Peter Thiel, uh, John, did you catch his recent comments where he was talking about how Bitcoin could be like, uh, a weapon against U.S. Uh, dollar diplomacy. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? I had tweeted a little bit about it at the time. I found his commentary a little bit confusing. And that was probably on purpose. Um, it, it was hard to tell which side of the, the narrative he actually was even on and what he was even suggesting. So I don't think we should read too much into what he's saying, so much as that he was speaking about Bitcoin. He was speaking about geopolitics. And these are real factors, you know. Um, but I don't think he said anything that I could really stick my fork in. That was the problem when I saw it. Like he, he, he was so woolly about what he was saying um, that like anyone who has one agenda or another could essentially say, oh, you know, he's actually just trying to warn the US they got to buy millions and billions of Bitcoin because otherwise everything, everyone's going to die. Or the other side could say, he's the worst ever and he hates Bitcoin and he's trying to say it's a China shit coin or something. I, so. I think it's better to default to the assuming the negative when it comes to think public commentary about Bitcoin. Cause like, think about like Bitcoin isn't a company. It has nobody like, it's very rare to find somebody that will speak benevolently of it only without their own ulterior motives or agenda, et cetera. Like everybody wants something out of Bitcoin, especially the rich people making businesses and products around it. So like you have to kind of think about that kind of thing, you know? Uh, we'll uh, we can move on to I guess a bit of a casual interview is probably the best way to put it. But uh, is there anything, Ricardo? Yeah, I want to know about the biz. Yeah, uh, exactly. Me too. Yeah, yeah. I, I I mean, for anyone who listened to our spaces a little while back, sorry um, that um, you know you may have already heard about it. But um, I think you know for anyone who's listening in, um, it'd be awesome for you to like essentially first off tell everyone about that because I say like at the time when I uh, saw it. Um, the way that it works with this like unlocking mechanism and stuff, I thought was pretty unique uh, and quite encouraging, actually. Um, so yeah, I guess um, please feel free to tell everyone about it. I sure. tell. I'll recap what it is and a little bit of why I did it. Um, so I've done, you know, I, I've when I was at BitRefill, I would I was par partly doing PR and, and business development, so I was doing interviews, you know, and podcasts and things like that. And I was doing I was doing a lot that year. I was like 2019, where I was doing a lot for BitRefill, and even before then, I had kind of off and on made content. And so it's kind of something I always like to do is, you know, uh, give my uh, interpretation of things with with other people in the dialogue. Um, but. Uh, I stopped liking being on podcasts that had like sponsors that I didn't want to support. I didn't really want, you know, certain companies benefiting from my time or, or anything to do with me. And so um, for that reason, I started, you know, thinking about ways to uh, have my own format, have my own podcast. So I wouldn't have to like do that so much and like be at events and, you know, have ads and sponsors, especially for the bad influence side of it, or what I felt would be like a corrupted influence of it, and what I could see in other podcasts. So, 
at the same time, I have this new company and a bunch of new tech and, and products that we want to release and integrate together. And so uh, the, the, the biz is that uh, the website is the biz.pro. The biz is kind of meant to be a little combination of uh, a venue for me to get content out. Um, since I'm not really that disciplined about like writing blog posts all the time, I figure I, I can at least consistently put out some interviews or, or, or podcasts. Um, combining that with like a little bit of teaser of some of the, at least scratching the surface of some of the themes of things we want to do with the new company. Um, and so the biz.pro basically it, it's a way that you can access a podcast, my, you know, specifically this podcast. Um, it's not like a, a platform that anybody can use at the moment. Um, but instead of like listening to ads, instead of paying per episode, instead of subscribing or being a Patreon member or any of these other things, the way it works is there's just one total goal. And this space, this goal essentially represents like costs to create an episode, you know, things like this, costs to grow, whatever. It's just it's somewhat arbitrary, but it's trying to place within what I think it's worth at the moment, you know, with, with the current fan base, et cetera. Um, and so, but it's just one goal that everybody pays towards. So it, it's like uh, the current goal on each episode is, I believe, 2.5 million sats. Um, and 50% of each episode, uh, the goal earned goes towards an open source project for Bitcoin. So like the first episode, uh, half of the money went to Jonas Schnelli. The second episode, half of it went to uh, Graphene OS. And then the current third episode, which is about half unlocked, um, half of this money will go to uh, the mempool project mempool.space um and basically when you make up when you when you pay you can pay with lightning or bitcoin um any amount you want to you unlock a, that proportion of the goal for everyone of the audio so if you pay for like one percent of the goal one percent of the audio now becomes permanently free and listenable for everyone until and this continues until 100 percent is unlocked and then this allows the uh, file to be downloadable the whole episode and it also uh, adds the episodes to we're, we're working with Bitcoin magazine to distribute, kind of syndicate the episodes once they've been unlocked. So they, they distribute the podcast within their own podcast streams on, you know, Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, et cetera. Um, trying to show a little bit, basically I'm trying to, the reason why I did this is, you know, I mentioned a few of the, the personal reasons, but also like for Bitcoin, like I wanted to inspire people a little bit to show them that like, there's stuff you can still do with Lightning, stuff you can still do with Bitcoin that has nothing to do with the protocol layer with like, you know, adding soft forks or, or creating whole new layer networks. There's just things you can do with implementing the tech um, and, and making it useful for people or being creative with people to see if things, you know, become popular. And so I just kind of wanted to show one example of just one attempt of saying, hey, here's how you can monetize something in a way that you couldn't really before uh, using Bitcoin and Lightning. Um, then in, within the page, you know, we demonstrate some other kind of small features, like there's a progressive unlock within the episode, there's progressive unlock per episode. And so everything is sequential. Are you familiar with, um, like the whole podcasting 2.0, um, movement being pushed by Adam Curry right now? And like the value for value model using Sphinx chat to, um, fund content creators. Like, did you arrive at like a model that sounds like really, really similar independently, or were you inspired by what those guys? Um, I would say we definitely were working independently. Um, I didn't know about podcasting 2.0 until maybe uh, a couple of weeks before they started talking about it. Um, I, I, like, I should say a couple of weeks before Sphinx Chat started talking about it. I don't even know if it existed as a concept before that. Um, but I do know Paul Atoy at Sphinx Chat very well. We talk pretty often, we meet pretty often, and we, we talk about each other's products and what we're building. And we're looking for ways to maybe work together in the future if, there, if there's anything appropriate, but just in general, like being peers to each other and, and, and meeting and talking about things and giving each other advice. Um, the podcasting 2.0 thing, this is more with Adam Curry, so it's not just a Sphinx Chat thing. Um, what I know about it, I don't know everything, and I definitely don't know all the narratives, but what I know is there is an interesting aspect of it related to like the indexing aspect, uh, having like a public index and this kind of thing. That kind of thing I'm very interested in, and it's very compatible with aspects of other things that we're making. So I probably will try to incorporate that specifically. Um, 
but the 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 wider narrative of like kind of you know value for value and these kinds of things i need to read about it more before i would say what i think about that or whatever because i kind of have developed a lot of my own thoughts about how value and in, in, in competition and stuff works on bitcoin and so i i'd like to compare it if i before saying anything i like the um yeah, the, the whole concept essentially. And I guess it's interesting what you said about like showing people that like different things can be done with Bitcoin and not even necessarily, you know, just someone who's super technically minded either, I guess. Like there's, 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 there's kind of something that you can get out of it or you can use almost with Bitcoin, even if you're a creative or, you know, because like, a lot of the time people who uh, talk to me in person um, will often say like, oh, I love, I love Bitcoin or I love crypto in general, but uh, I want to get involved. But hey, I'm not a developer or hey, I, I don't know how to do like coding, or whatever. And I don't really think it's for me. And I'm like, well, there's tons of ways you can get involved. Like even if it's just volunteering to uh, do something or going to shops and kind of helping them uh, implement uh, a BTC pay server or something like there's time, so many different things you can do if you're not like a, a super like developer minded person. Um, and so I guess, as you say, like the ability to, um, to like kind of have something new with Bitcoin, like unlock these podcasts and like have them also like crowdfunded to a degree and have that split between like a charitable foundation and then a, or, or charity and then um, itself. It's like, it makes, it makes sense to me um, as like a, a cool kind yeah. of creative solution. Uh, so I like it a lot. This may sound stupid as I say it, but like I'm starting to actually think that, everybody is creative and everybody is a designer and everybody is an engineer. And it's really the difference between like people is like their spe- where they specialize in what, in what they design and, and how broad, how wide they'll make their designs, like how many different disciplines they'll include, uh, you know, different things they've mastered in order to create a design. Um, I know it's kind of abstract, but uh, I, I think that's kind of how it works. Like I, I think that everybody has some creativity and ability to manipulate what they've learned. And it's all of our responsibility is to like learn as much as we can about the things that we feel, you know, uh, adept at. Um, so we can, you know, contribute and always climb this ladder, et cetera. Going back to what you were saying about implementing the Bitcoin tech uh, without messing around with the, you know, improvements on the protocol level. Uh, what are your thoughts about the tapper thing that's about to roll out? Uh, let me say, should, should I give a safe answer or a fun one? Um, fun one, fun one. <laughs> I'll start with the safe answer, which was for, for, you know, I'm not, an, I'm not qualified. I'm not, you know, obviously a crypto cryptographic cryptography expert or an engineer for Bitcoin base layer, but it does seem like a safe upgrade. It does seem like a sensible upgrade. It adds some practical features for Bitcoin that should be useful, you know, without, without much to complain about as far as I know. But the flip side, the more fun thing would I would to say would might be, I'm just I'm just starting to feel really against changes to Bitcoin and like when I see these conversations about like what will the activation method be and what will what's the best way to have governance for what to put in core or when to have a BIP and all of these conversations they truly make me cringe. Like I I think like this conversation does not result in anything good. Like if they, if they succeed in making the governance more defined, then Bitcoin has become weaker. Um, and, and so like, I don't actually want to help them figure out how to do a soft fork. I don't think they should learn how to do it. <laughs> like, I, I just kind of feel like the way it should work is there's just people who make software and that software can become popular and, it's their own problem for how that happens, how the software gets made, how it gets adopted, and that's just it, you know. And if if core developers want to work on something, it it would be like making that as as uh, safe as possible. Um, it's probably wishful thinking, but yeah, I I don't like the nature of the conversations. It makes me not trust any of the people involved, even though like they haven't done anything wrong. Really, it's just like. When you see, you know, engineers lobbying for certain, you know, approaches and designs, when the trade-offs aren't really like, they should be like things that should be rationalized. And when you see like lobbying, like I've noticed there's a lobby for the CTV soft fork, which would come after Taproot, and people want like this check time lock verify feature. And I noticed the lobby is strong, and I'm thinking, and it's not the usual people, it's not the usual core developers. And I'm thinking, okay, this is weird, like. Now I feel like I have to learn about it. I have to learn about these people, learn why they care so much, learn what the trade-offs are of this soft work because there might actually be something dangerous here because there's obviously some sort of incentive that has attracted people that didn't exist before. And that scares me. 
I guess it's like, uh, I kind of try to think of it as like the UN, like uh, people will spend a lot of time lobbying and, and worrying about governments that actually they won't end up getting anything done in the end. <laughs> that's kind of part of my worry a little bit. But uh, Well, but that's different because in government, spinning your wheels you still get your paycheck you're maybe even more likely to get your paycheck but it doesn't really work that way in, in open source development like all the work you do is sunk cost like even if somebody pay you to do it it doesn't mean that any value will be generated from anything you did like and and that's even if somebody paid you to do it sure so i guess it's almost like a less of an incentive for for someone to, to do that when they're not like in, in government there's certain people that have the 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 mind state that bitcoin is sufficiently ossified the way it is and that we shouldn't add any more changes to it and that we should just build on top of it what's your opinion on that i think the fair answer would be to say if i'm not an expert on when it is to change it i'm probably not also not an expert on whether to not change it um, so, you know, disclaiming that, that like, how would I know either way? Um, I would say that in the end, conserve being conservative is probably, you know, th there's a definition to that word and it means not changing and keeping things the way they are. And, you know, basically betting on the probability of, of the past and that things will stay the way they are. Um, obviously that, that always becomes false at some point. So yeah, it's, a uh, paradox i guess i guess uh one of the questions i wanted to ask you um and it seems kind of like it fits in with this conversation actually uh is i i'm assuming <laughs> as as everyone has you saw about the uh, well there was actually a blank block mine not that long ago i think today even but besides that point you know the censorship resistant no the censorship censorship of all whatever we want to say the block that was mined uh by that mining group in the u.s um that essentially was a blank block to Marathon. prove yeah, Marathon, that's it, thanks, to prove that um, Bitcoin could be censored, essentially. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, I mean, as to whether it's a good or a bad thing. Um, but also, I guess it comes into this thing of, well, if we're, I guess if we're not, if we're looking to be conservative and not necessarily make many changes, um, we could then be going down this road of essentially kind of allowing Bitcoin to to not be permissionless, essentially, if it, because, you know, a lot of these mining companies could start to, appear um uh, that will be censoring transactions and then it yeah it, it loses a core part of its yeah. purpose it depends on the context you want to talk about it like if you want to talk about it like what the degree like how, how much should we actually worry about this as a threat or that kind of thing um I, I would say that like uh you you it's definitely not a good thing um but you could probably argue whether or not it's also not a bad thing um, and what I mean that by that is the function to choose which transactions go into a block has always been, the, you know, the power of the miners. And I don't know, I'd have to think about or remember or, or research a bit whether that could be designed differently or, sh or should have been. But the truth is, that's the way it is. And that's the way it's been. And that's what we have to deal with. Um, the game theory is supposed to work out that it just doesn't matter because that's why we have a fee market. Like, in other words, as long as there is some miner somewhere willing to mine that transaction and the person trying to get it mined is willing to pay the fee that that miner wants, it will get mined. And, and, and blacklisting is just basically choosing to not make money on those transactions. That's all, you know, choosing to not have those block rewards. And in that sense, miners are very heavily disincentivized to blacklist because it, all it means is they're saying, I don't want your money. They just like, like literally saying, I don't want, you know, somebody told me your money is bad. And not only do I not want to help you, I don't want you to pay me to help you. Um, and on a, in a certain level, like if you're a voluntarist or, you know, depending on your beliefs, that's not the worst thing in the world to think, okay, well, a minor maybe should be able to decide what he does or doesn't do. Um, probably a different conversation. Uh I don't think it plays out. But what I will say, there is a whole other flip side to this where some, I do believe at some point governments and, and people and companies will figure out that they can use things, not necessarily blockchains, but that they can use, say, PGP or key pairs to create environments that they can really digitally enforce severely. And the, the, the odds of us like having a dystopian outcome like that movie uh, – 
the one with Justin Timberlake, I forget what it's called, Time or something, where there's like time credits or whatever, like, or or the the dystopia that China is already approaching. Some people would would say, um, with you know, face scanning everything everywhere and everybody never having privacy, like Orwellian kind of dystopia, I guess. I would say like hyper Orwell Orwellian. Like I'm talking about like somewhere in between Orwellian and you know AI destroying everything and all the jobs there's this there's this future where you know governments really can pretty much find you wherever you are know everything you're doing whenever you're doing it who you're doing it with and be able to like totally have interoperable reputation about you with whoever they want to have interoperable reputation with you about so they could tell you know portugal not to let you into the country on for whatever reason at whatever moment they could tell amazon not to sell you things they could like it'll just become harder and harder to be an anonymous uh reputationless internet citizen and and that the outcome all the technology that we're making for freedom um the funny thing about it is what we're doing is we're just adding control over part of the spectrum that didn't really have intentional UI or control before. Like you could always form say private networks on the internet. You could always have private ledgers with other people in those private networks that you trusted. Like you could always kind of do these kind of things um, if you had some trust. And once we start measuring trust on the internet and uh, you know, people start using things like digital IDs and, and credentials and all the things that are going to be coming up with technology. It'll be really hard to avoid dystopia. It'll be really hard for uh, to avoid if there's a government willing to enforce with violence to avoid a government that wants to create, like, say, a meritocracy or communism or any type of, you know, political design through a rule set that's, that's enforced digitally. They'll probably be able to do that at some point. And so there is a kind of scary possible future and really the only way we can avoid it i think is by becoming more responsible and more intelligent you know basically saying instead of letting those systems happen and using those systems and accepting those systems understanding the danger of those systems and the advantage of using kind of self-sovereign alternatives that you that the user has control over um and that way people can point at something to fight for when the government is doing the other path you know no, that's a really good point, and I, I guess like I'm, I'm reluctant to let my kind of like personal strong beliefs on the <laughs> on the world kind of bleed in too much. But um, yeah, I guess I, this is like my well, with this kind of um, every time something like this kind of uh, censored block and things like that occurs, it kind of sets off this little trigger in my brain of like this fear factor of you know when I first read uh, like 1984 or something, and I thought, holy crap, you know this could happen, and it kind of it kind of is happening a little bit as well already, and, and I guess it kind of sets that off in my brain, and I start thinking towards this kind of yeah china kind of super dystopian yeah. future and i think crap if bitcoin's going to support that somehow now and oh my god you know like could it be used i, for I that? think my point is more that uh i don't think that's going to happen i don't think that there's an actual risk or danger for that in bitcoin or for bitcoin but i do think there is an actual danger of that kind of thing just in the internet um and, and so i think you're right to worry in the in the in the abstract but in bitcoin i don't think it's an actual problem like uh between the fact that the, the game theory of miners competing with each other and then the you know upgrades in technology of things like Taproot that kind of mask what you're doing with transactions. Eventually, I just think it's going to be near impossible to like blacklist a specific UTXO or person through Bitcoin. You're going to need like other vectors. Like you're going to need to know their email or SMS. You, you need to know about them, like their, their whole presence. Yeah, because the way I, when I first learned about Bitcoin properly, um, and kind of got to understand it rather than just, you know, the basic level um, that you need to kind of trade or whatever. Um, I kind of thought of mining. It was like, okay, when you mine a block, you get paid your kind of salary by the Bitcoin system or network, or whatever. And then you kind of have the transaction fees, which I kind of thought of in my head as like bribes. So it's like, come yeah, on, you're bribing yes. the miners. So I guess there's always a way that like the, you can say, okay, well, this uh, mining company is not going to take the bribes. They're like, no, thank you. We want a clean block. We'll take our salary. But then there's always going to be, I guess on the flip side, there's always going to be someone. There's always going to be a miner who's like, yeah, hell yeah, I'll take your bribe. <laughs> like there's always going to be someone who wants money. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, the way it plays out is that's a lot more money than you think. Like the at times like this, I haven't looked lately, but I'm guessing that the block reward and fees uh probably equals or exceeds the block reward itself at times when 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 bitcoin fees are high and when you have a situation like that like 
it's just too much money to leave on the table. Like you, you just have to be basically have to be the government to, <laughs> to be willing to leave that money on the table. John, I want to switch gears for a second. I had a question. Um, some of our most popular lightning wallets are custodial lightning wallets. Where do you see the future of lightning? Do you see it as more of like a custodial service that's going to be mainstreamed or do you see uh, people managing their own channels. It's just that it hasn't been like the UI hasn't been developed enough and lightning will stay independent. Uh, I was talking about this a bit today with, with some of the people in the company. And I think that like, I try, I, I didn't really get it as well as I get it now, but even early on, like I, when I was at BitRefill, I wrote an article on Bitcoin magazine saying something like to the effect of uh Lightning network protocol development is a marketplace. Basically, it's a competition. And I think that uh, still today, like kind of like how like people really misunderstood, everybody basically misunderstood Bitcoin for the first like five years. Like, you know, you had Roger Ver saying uh, like how it was cheap and, you know, all, all these qualities that weren't really quite sensible. Um, I think we did, we did maybe the same thing with Lightning um, where... A lot of people projected onto it that it was supposed to be like the end all be all scaling method, that it was also somehow going to give us great narratives against arguing against shit coins, that it was going to provide, you know, scaling, instant, high frequency, messaging, uh, microtransaction. Basically, it was like our decentralized web. It was like our, our, our great white hope kind of thing. Um, and I think that that's our own fault. That's like Bitcoin Twitter trying to cheerlead and be supportive and, you know, it being hard to actually learn how things work at all anyway. Um, and, and so we kind of go by shorthand and what we can best pick up about it. And we try to project whatever positivity we can to it. And so I think what, what I'm getting at is the major misconceptions are that I think that Lightning only has like actual two or three qualities that are added to Bitcoin. And those should have been the focuses. And that's like, instantaneousness of bitcoin transactions um that is a quality that bitcoin transactions don't really have unless you accept zero conf um and it's worth something so in other words i think people would pay for it um and then high frequency transactions um so this way if you know you're going to be doing a high quantity of transactions why do them on chain because you can save a lot of money this way in fees if you use lightning and then the third one um, which I, I haven't brought up so much in the past, but it, I, I definitely think is now a full third one, uh, the full third quality of Lightning transactions is Lightning gave us the ability to add centralization to Bitcoin. And this is a big one that I don't think people appreciate or know how to design with or yet. Um, everybody's scared about like keeping Lightning decentralized and keeping routing across complex networks, you know, uh, possible and complex routing solutions and, you know, all these things to do with assuming that like every single Bitcoin user is going to be like having a bunch of channels connecting to multiple people, blah, 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 blah. This to me, this, this, this theory, this projection onto Lightning of how it could work, it doesn't match with the three qualities that I mentioned. It doesn't match with instant high frequency centralized what does match business i think lightning all along like the user the target user the use case was always business and it should have always been business and that the only context for individual users is in their relationship with businesses um and so I, i'm not trying to discount like the kind of self-sovereign capability or running a lightning node yourself or actually doing the kind of you know uh, complex network connected to a lot of people thing but i just it won't last like bitcoin is too expensive and lightning will be too expensive eventually to do that to just you know altruistically do things and experiment and, and that kind of thing it just it just won't last and so you're going to find that eventually lightning in my opinion eventually lightning is just going to be like 20 to 50 nodes uh, depend you know proportion to the size of whatever bitcoin is grown to um, of all the most successful businesses in Bitcoin. Um, that basically, the, the people that have the most, that are the most common endpoints, like BitRefill, wallets, exchanges, this is the Lightning Network. It's a place to connect with, with common high frequency endpoints um, and be able to do so safely um, while being instant. So you can have centralization without giving up the custody. Do you see like central banks or like state owned nodes 
uh, becoming a thing like lightning notes? Nah. Um, banks have never been that technically savvy as, as entities they are always kind of really far behind the curve. Uh, so I, I can't really see them having, see them having like lightning developers on staff or, um, worrying too much about incorporating into their banking because they have to have some incentive. Like being a middleman for Bitcoin is hard and banks don't do like banks aren't exchanges. They're not there to like, you know, exchange money all the time. Although I think they're going to become that. I think that there's a good reason why exchanges have become the biggest thing and the biggest parallel to banks in the Bitcoin world. I said, I think, and, and oh, and if you look at Revolut, like a lot of Revolut's utility is, is in exchanging currencies as well. And so I, I, they're not trading based, but I think you're going to see a merge of these things even more than you have. I got like a count as soon as I heard they existed when it was like years yeah. ago. And oh, it's really uh, useful for me. Like, yeah. Being American, living in Romania, buying from Amazon, Germany, like <laughs> credit cards don't work as you expect. <laughs> yeah, it is handy. And like when I was in Brazil, when I wasn't using, because I genuinely did use um, like uh, two third bit refill a lot at the time. This is before I worked with bit refill. I, I spent a lot of time using them um, because it was like I was basically living on crypto for quite a few weeks, whole, sort of wholly. And then uh, other than that, it was essentially Revolut was kind of saving my skin, really. Um, frustrating though i guess because like i remember when uh because I, I kind of reached out to them and to see if they like uh, accept any business accounts that deal with crypto and they explicitly like banned essentially business accounts like any business account that dealt with crypto so it's kind of like oh, okay so you kind of create your entire image and business i think even them. coinbase gave up doing business account i mean not for trading or whatever but like for retail like they had a whole retail arm and retail effort and they they drop that i think i guess what i'm saying is like uh revolute has like revolute uh current accounts like uh what's the word i'm looking for people account i can't think of the word but yeah general people's accounts <laughs> um whatever the best word for that is and then they have business accounts like you can just any business can sign up but if that business is a business that like, accepts cryptocurrency or deals with cryptocurrency they can't sign up for revolute business yeah. or corporate company accounts which i've kind of felt a bit of like a slap in the face to like you know this is what created you and kind of gave you your brand to a degree. And now you're not accepting it for businesses. I found that a little bit weird, but I mean, I say I'm not here to slag them off, but I just found that a bit strange and disappointing at the time. But otherwise I've only got good things to say, I guess. Uh, in general, Bitcoiners get way too excited about banks adding Bitcoin and Bitcoin being added to fiat finance. Like, like it's nice because your bags might pump a little bit more, a little bit earlier, I guess, if, if you're going to sell. Um, but like, it's just not impressive to me to see like uh, banks adding Bitcoin and, you know, Western Union adding Bitcoin and, and, you know, these kinds of things. Like it's just, they're just trying to leech on Bitcoin. They're just trying to keep up. Like Bitcoin is, is supposed to replace them, not be a new tool for them. While you're talking about that, it, it made me wonder, what's your opinion on this whole uh, CBDC movement that like 80% of central banks are working on? I don't know if it's 80% um, because I know that at least the US is waiting to see what other people do, um, which is probably all bullshit. They probably all have research labs and whatever. But um, I see great utility in tokens as a concept. Um I th obviously it would be, I just think it would be obnoxious to deny that Tether has utility. Like you just don't get to be that large for that long without there obviously being people who like your product. Um, so I, I do think, you know, uh, tokens as credit, as redeemable things on tr from trusted entities, like that, that's, there's a lot of utility there and maybe even all the utility you might need from tokens. Um, but CBDC is like, I don't see the point because the dollar is already digital, right? And so the only thing that you can do by making a CBDC is some kind of either claim, it will be a false claim of transparency um, because like, you know people can audit the blockchain and look at what you're doing. But I'm going to guess that whatever they actually chose would technically make that not possible. <laughs> um, and then like to add features to the dollar that are enforceable. And the only example that I've heard that like, is sensible, not sensible, but like uh, digestible, understandable is uh, this concept of like expiring money. Like, and I, I could see why a, why a central bank might think that's interesting because they really want people to spend when they want them to spend. And they like, and if they're going to keep printing money and giving out handouts and UBI and all these things, they're going to want to have, be able to earmark and control the types of credit they issue eventually. 
because it, it's just not, it just makes no sense to take money from the citizens as taxes and, you know, ever, whatever ways you take it from them and then just give it back. Like that's that you're not serving a purpose anymore. Right. And so in order to serve a purpose and leverage the power they have as a government, they're going to do stuff like that. They're going to say, okay, if we, if we have a digital currency that is now we can add like enforceable rules to it, what enforceable rules can we add? How will we do it? But the problem is that as long as, Bitcoin can still compete or even Tether can still compete. They're going to have problems like because if, like if Tethers don't expire, I would just always convert my CBDCs to Tethers at least. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, I guess trusting Tether is probably more risky than trusting, you know, the Fed. Uh, but it, it's, you know, that this, this, com this competitive kind of situation isn't going to go away. And so I, I think that uh, there are some people arguing that CBDCs are just sort of, sort of pointless and they'll kind of die on the vine. That's a possible outcome. Um, I predicted that's what would happen with Facebook, that it would never launch the the DM or whatever. I forget what it was called, um, but the Facebook coin. Uh, and, and it never did. Um, I think they're still working on the wallet or whatever. But I just don't think that like... It's not easy to issue a currency and not be a government. <laughs> right. I think Facebook, they got... Uh, they got so much like uh, attack from different governments and like they, just, they chose the worst strategy for for unveiling it for you know they chose the pr strategy as if they had already won and the problem was that they, they didn't already win and they basically they just said they made it look like they was, could scare everybody from the beginning and, that, and that's what they got they got a bunch of politicians scared at what they were proposing yeah and it just kind of went straight down from there i guess they should uh, have yeah. learned from shit coiners that you, you ask for permission later <laughs> do it and then ask i guess like with the As forgiveness it, i mean yeah with it with expirable um expirable currency um this is something that we've seen like the digital yuan yuan i can never say it correctly but the chinese digital currency um it's something that we've seen um they've been trialing uh that's like one of those things that again like kind of plays to my kind of like a uh, little kind of dystopian trigger in my head or because I, I i kind of see it as like with modern economics like there's, there's this kind of idea of this sort of boom bust kind of uh you know and they kind of just with interest rates they'll they'll lower interest rates to the point where you're getting nothing in your banks so you may as well just invest it and spend it often unwisely and make stupid decisions and then when you've kind of lost all your money then the interest rates start to go up again to kind of stop you from buying tons of stupid crap uh, and i guess with the the time stamped money or the the money that disappears after a certain period of time it's like an even easier tool uh, on top of or instead of interest rates um, to kind of make you spend more unwisely and even more unwisely uh, and, and invest in Tesla or invest in whatever you want to invest in and, and then get exposed. Uh, later yeah, on the I mean, if they're still printing a bunch of money and adding tricks to it, like they're just going to fail hard. Like it's just, it's too much stacked against you. And like all these things are just games to avoid looking like what's really happening. And what's really happening is you have money, the government is taking it from you and deciding where to put it instead. And, and it's all different versions of that. And so they're hiding that, they're masking that because they know that if you know that and think about that all the time, that you won't like it. And so they find they have inflation as a game. They have, you know, uh, maybe expiring currencies or tax exemptions. They have all kinds of games that you have to play to just keep your money. It's frustrating, that's for certain. I guess, uh, well, th there are more things I could ask you, but I don't want to drag you on for, th for three hours. <laughs> I guess something like that. Um, right, Ricardo, is there anything you wanted to, to uh, burning, burning questions? I guess well, I actually had one real quick question. Um, and I didn't know you could tell me to, to piss off. Um, but uh, with, the, with the business, the company, I know obviously things are still under wraps to a degree. and uh, It's been opening up a little bit uh, with like, uh, hiring and stuff or at least looking for hiring um is there anything you can say about what's going on any 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 secrets i, I you forgot can... what i said last time in this in the Twitter <laughs> spaces but maybe this time will be a little more elaborate or a little more detailed um okay so the the company is basically inspired by trying to prove what i would define as the bitcoin thesis like how i would define it um or another way of saying that is, I thought that Bitcoin needed a company where, uh, you know, we're always like pointing at shitcoiners and saying, you don't need a shitcoin for that. You don't need a token for that. You don't need, you know, you don't need to do that. This doesn't make sense. It's not sound. It's not safe. It's not secure, blah, blah, blah. And the only thing we ever point them to is Bitcoin. 
We don't point them to what to do instead when they say, use an altcoin for decentralized web, use an altcoin for DeFi, use an alt like all the things that they like they they hype, all the all the like what they would claim as innovative tech or interesting or worthy of you know uh, being open minded about. Um, we don't actually often point them to the alternative and say, well, here's how you do it without being an asshole. Um, and I wanted there to be one company that was doing that, that was making sure that like all the things that were, that were all the claims we're making about Bitcoin, that there's at least one product stack that, that supports all of the examples of what, of how to do it with Bitcoin without using, you know, uh, speculative, you know, blockchains and things like this. So that's the, you know, as far as like vision or overall, uh, what, what, you know, theme of what we're doing, that, that is part of it. Um, and so, yeah, we're building multiple products to kind of demonstrate that vision and demonstrate basically like this loop that would make uh, a circular economy kind of example for Bitcoin. Um, and this, you know, I, since I already told some people about some of the things, one of the, one of the products is a wallet. Um, and then there are kind of two or three, depending how you measure other products that all work together with the wallet and each other to basically complete this loop to do what I would say is create an alternative economy for Bitcoin um, using the internet, not just Bitcoin. So, you know, being able to do any kind of business that can be expressed digitally and, and peer with anybody, you know, over any way that you could express digitally, just all, all these things that I feel like you would need to be able to operate in a totally new digital environment. Um, and, and what you would have, what you would need if you didn't have banks, if you were truly unbanked and all you had was Bitcoin, um, how would it actually work? What does the society look like, at least on a digital level? I like that. That's a good vision. <laughs> I the ability to kind of create this kind of, uh, sort of a little more abstract than I hoped to give you. But it, it, again, I, I'm trying to avoid like, I, I've already probably done more than I should have, but I'm trying to avoid being vaporware, trying to avoid uh, digging a hole too deep for myself and making claim, making wild claims. But like, you know, You'll catch me putting that aside once once we have some public stuff released and, and announcements made, then I'll be a lot more hypey and, and yeah, explanatory. But uh, for the moment, I'm just like, I'm trying to contain myself because I really do feel like there's, there's some really, really cool stuff that we've made that could really change the way things are for Bitcoin and for the internet. Um, and, and so I'm hoping that we're right about that side of it where it's actually super cool but I'm okay with it just being actually, you know, making sensible and people using it and finding utility in it as well. So we'll see. No, I get, I get the grand picture and Hey, I like the abstract discussion. That's kind of my kind of thing. So it's fine by me, but um, okay. Well, yeah, I say I won't drag you any along any longer, man. Ricardo, any, anything you want to, to ask at all? No, no. Okay, Great conversation. Leave it. We can Thanks leave for it coming on. No, yeah. Thank you so say, much for having me. Really appreciate you coming on. Um, it's been awesome to talk to you for a second time. I'm blessed. And uh, hopefully we can you know, uh, talk to you on our spaces or a podcast uh, you know, in, in the future, especially if like, you know, you've got um, a lot more information about like, the business and, you're, and you, you know, you release that and you want to talk about that. That'd be awesome if we could do that. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, what I'll do now is I'll, I'll read out the, uh, the positive news for this week uh, to leave everyone on on a nice little note. Uh, leave us all with a smile um, after listening to the podcast. Um, but yeah, before I do, really appreciate you coming on, John, again. It's, uh, it, was, uh, it was awesome. Thank you. And appreciate all the listeners for listening as well. Uh, so, okay, here goes. Staff at Stockton University in New Jersey are caring for more than 800 baby turtles rescued from storm drains by volunteers. Recently, California hit a day where 95% of their energy came from solar power, over 80% of the state. Duke University has produced the world's first fully recyclable electronic transistor, which they 3D printed. Luxury hotel chain Veles Resorts has thanked 100 healthcare heroes with all-inclusive vacations. Researchers have discovered that solar cell performance can be boosted by the use of human hair that they got from a barbershop. And lastly, my favorite one, a once homeless Nigerian boy has become chess champion in the United States at 10 years old, uh, being the first competitor to ever win a state championship on their first try which I thought was absolutely insane. Uh, he's not the national champion, but he's won like a state championship, which, hey, congrats to that guy. Like, you know, big up to that guy. But um, yeah, so that's the, that's the positive Beginner's news. luck. 
yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> that's the positive news for uh for this week so yeah again thank you john thank you listeners thank you ricardo um everyone out there have an awesome week awesome day awesome evening whatever time it is and uh, remember to buy bitcoin <laughs>